Let's stand together, grab a pew Bible or your own, open it up to 2 Timothy chapter 1, and hopefully we've read this so much and you've meditated on it for five weeks now that you know this passage quite well. Uh, You may even have took it upon yourself to memorize it. Uh, These are good things that we take God's word into our life, reflecting on them as we live in this world. So let us read God's word, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 14, as we, in a way, conclude our Advent series, but we culminate it tonight. I would encourage you to come and understand more of what it means that God is with us. So verse 8, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death And brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher. Which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me. In the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. This is the word of our living God. You may be seated. Dennis, uh, this morning, brought up the issue of humility. And as we talk about this morning, our condition in our sinful state, in the righteousness of Christ. Knowing those things, not, in our, not only in our mind, but in our heart, will produce humility. A true understanding and an expression of that resides in these truths that we talk about today. So as we've gone through uh, this Advent, we've brought up a number of questions. Each Sunday, I've posed a question How can you, how can I know our hope? How can we know our peace? How can we know joy? How can we know our love? How can we know these things, not only in our mind doctrinally, which is very important, because that is the root, the fountain of what comes next in our behavior, in our life, in our conduct, in our character, in what we do. How can we know these things? Know them clearly and convictionally, By the word of God alone. So today, how can you, how can I know my righteousness? How can you know your righteousness? Well, we've been looking at these terms in doctrinal terms. But again, as I've said over and over again, don't ever detach doctrine from life. Don't ever detach doctrine from practicality in life. All of the teaching of God Better not be despised in that regard, but known that it affects who you are. It affects what you do. It will, regardless. But we need to have a clear understanding and a love for God's truth so that we see it out in our life. So how can you, how can I know my righteousness? How can you know your righteousness? Well, in one fundamental way, know what's been known as total depravity. Know that doctrine, total depravity. What does that mean? That's what we'll get into today in its practical aspects and how this then connects to the idea of righteousness. So this is one of the most basic and fundamental issues. It really is. The Bible is so utterly clear on this issue and looks at it from so many different angles that we really need to see this in the Scriptures. Because if we don't, then we are going to distort, change so many things. So many things. This is fundamental. So it brings the question of, how bad am I? As a sinner, 
standing before a holy and righteous God as we all are, the question is that we all have to ask and answer rightly, how bad am I apart from the saving work of Christ? What is my true natural condition? How would you answer that? This, as I mentioned, is offensive to our very nature because we want to take some ounce, some percentage of righteousness, whether oftentimes we don't even say righteousness, it's some other uh, terminology, some other explanation. We want to take some percentage and say that we are good in some aspect of our nature. We have some goodness within us. And boy, is that thrown about today, isn't it? And many, and I'm going to be honest here, as I came to this church telling this truth, many didn't like it. Many left because of this. But you need to understand it. I need to understand it. We all do. To understand who we truly are apart from Christ. There is so many Christians today, and this has grown over the years, that believe that we have some amount of innocence in us by nature. That is scary. That is really scary because it ultimately undermines who? Christ. And the righteousness of Christ. Christ. So we need to see the utter extremes between us and Him. Between our condition, who He is. Between what happened to us and why He came. This ultimately drives at that question, why did Jesus come? Because if we have some ounce of goodness in us, then why do we need redemption? Why do we need a new life, a new heart. These are the issues, and we better face them honestly in the Scriptures. So what is total depravity? Again, it answers the question of how bad we are. And this is the juxtaposition, the contrast between total depravity and a giving in to a free will in our salvation. And I note and emphasize in our salvation. Because as human beings, I have a free will in a sense that I can choose pizza instead of a salad for lunch, and I often would. Not a fan of salads. Right? I have that ability. And we often conflate the two. But when it comes down to the very salvation of our soul... Do I really, according to the Scriptures, have a free will? Is it up to me in the last final say-so of whether I am saved or not? Is that decision ultimately left in my hands? That's the question. And what does the Scriptures teach about that? It ultimately goes back down again to who we are. What is our condition? What's the condition of our heart? Do we have ability in us? These are all important questions. And so total depravity is the biblical teaching that we are dead inside. Right? Where's the passage that would cite that? Well, there's a number of them. But Ephesians 2 walks slowly in that. We were dead in trespasses and sins. This is Paul saying that if you're in Christ, this is who you used to be. And he includes himself in that. We were dead in trespasses and sins. Meaning for Paul and those in Christ, you're not anymore. So death, what does that mean? Spiritual death, what does that actually mean? Well, the Bible fleshes this out even more. And so we'll get into a number of aspects of that, but but we need to be incredibly clear on this. Because if we're not, then we are going to have a confusion, a cloudiness of 
again, who Christ is. We need to see him clear in an utter purity of who he really is. And again, if we see him and who he really is, then we will have an understanding of who we truly are. So how does this, how do we see this, first of all, in this passage that we've been studying? What part of this passage really teaches this? And again, I reiterate and and remind you, connect all of these chains that we've been talking about. Connect these statements. They have to go together because then they expand and magnify the meaning of this. But uh, the, the gospel is the power of God. The power of God for what? To bring you to life. To give you a new heart. To give you salvation. If your faith is the, the action in which that causes you to then be born again, which many believe. They put faith before being born again. It's the cause of your being born again. Let me ask you a question. Why do you need a new heart? Because being born again is the biblical concept of the Spirit of God coming to you and taking that heart of stone out of you and giving you a heart of flesh. That's the mysterious work of the sovereign Holy Spirit. So if your faith is what causes you to be born again, why do you need a new heart? Because you can do righteous things before being born again. That's what faith is according to God. Right? He deemed Abraham's faith as righteousness. He counted it as righteousness. So God says faith is a righteous act. So if your faith is the cause of you being born again, then you can do righteous acts according to God before you're brought to life, before you're given a new heart? How does that make sense? So we need to search the Scriptures biblically. So the power of God in the gospel comes to bring us salvation, giving us a holy calling, not because of our own works, Not because of our own effort in any capacity, in any way, but because of his own purpose and grace. Grace cannot be mixed with our working, our effort, our doing in any way. Otherwise, it's not grace. It cannot be 99% grace and 100% you a little bit. Even if God gives you a little nudge, gives you even a little bit amount of grace, but then leaves that, that rest up to you. All, grace is all of God. Grace is the very power of God working within you to cause you to do what is pleasing for Him. From the beginning to the end, from faith for faith. So grace, right here, we need to understand biblically what is that. Second of all, as He comes down to the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Let's pull that apart because this is where we see it more clearly. What is the context in which Paul is talking about? He's talking about salvation. He's talking about salvation coming to a people, coming to an individual, coming to a sinner, and giving them a holy calling Right, A purpose in life that is God's purpose for them that will be fulfilled. So it's in the context of salvation. And so what is this, what is this death that he's referring to? It's the effect of sin. Spiritual death. Spiritual death. What does that really mean again? How does that address your heart, your love, your ability, your desires? So he came to abolish death. Ultimately, this is pointing to that second death. So that those who are in Christ, when you die, it's just an entrance into glory. It's just an entrance into the presence of your Lord and Savior. Death has no hold over you because death had no hold over your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're in him, it cannot have a hold over you. It won't keep you. And so this is to abolish death, to abolish a spiritual death so that you can have life and have it abundantly. 
so that you can be carried on by the power of the Spirit for the rest of your life and then enter into glorification. So he came to abolish death and to bring life. What life? Your life that you need in your heart and your soul. It's a soul you're talking about here. That just concept should even just cause us to stop and say, do I really have a free will in my salvation? Do I really have an ability in my salvation? Is it really up to me? He came to bring life. Why? Because we have none. You apart from salvation, you have no life. The scriptures clearly teach this. You have no life. But you need it. You need it. You need life. And it comes from that saving work where you, a dead sinner, and here's an illustration, Lazarus. Lazarus was dead. Did he have any ability in and of himself to put out his hand, to decide for Christ, to bring him back to life? No. But that's what many people believe. No, Jesus powerfully raised him from the dead. That is an illustration of being born again. That's the life that you need. So we abolished death and brought life and immortality. Immortality, the reality of eternity. Eternity is at every corner. You will continue to live on. You will have an endless life. But the question is where? With who? So Jesus came to bring that reality to light through the gospel, to make it known, to bring it to light, to make it known, to proclaim it, to declare that this is true, that this is why he came, and this is your condition. It's revealed in the message that was a mystery before the coming of Christ, but now has been made known, has been revealed in the Son of God. The very fact that He came tells us how bad we are. If we have any ounce of goodness that we can choose God, why did He need to come? Answer that question if you believe in free will. Why did He need to come? If it's up to you, why did he need to come? Well, because we were a little bit sick and we needed some help. That's ultimately what a lot of people believe or what their beliefs come out to. Again, what does the scripture say? This is God's authoritative word. If we deny this, we're denying him. If we turn aside and go to our own opinions, our own beliefs that are contrary to him, then we're disobedient to his word. Are we going to believe it? Come to understand it and, and see the beauty? Because again, at the very heart of these issues, total depravity and righteousness is humility. Being humbled before God. And so total depravity really speaks about our condition, our ability, our desire, our nature. And this is where we can do a systematic theological study of the Scriptures for a long, long time. <laughs> a long time. What does all of the Bible say about this very subject? I'll give you just snippets. Romans 3, verses 9 through 18. No one is good. No, not one. No one is righteous. No, not one. Everyone is worthless. Together they've turned aside. No one has fear of God before their eyes. All of it. Go read that. That's talking about our nature apart from Christ. But the problem is, in many evangelical churches, when that is preached, when a pastor and a preacher says that there is no, not one, and they describe it biblically, there's many people in the pews that say, no, I'm an exception. No, I believe I have some goodness in me. How dare you say I am a bad person? Make it known I'm not telling you God is. Why? What's the purpose of that? So you can see Christ. 
so you can come to him truly for who he truly is and why you truly need him. No one is good. You think you're the exception? Paul says, no, not one. No one. I've already mentioned Ephesians 2. Dead in trespasses and sins. Like the rest of mankind, children of wrath. That's what Paul says about you without Christ. You're a child of wrath. Meaning that God's wrath is abiding over you when you come into the world. When you're conceived in your mother's womb, God's wrath is abiding over every single one of us. Go read the end of John 3. You need to believe in Christ so that you can come out from underneath that wrath. So that Jesus Christ could soak that wrath up for you. So that wrath would not abide over you anymore. But it remains if you're without Christ. And that's all who we are coming into the world. I mentioned this last week, John 6. John 6 is such a clear, clear teaching of all of these reformed doctrines of salvation that we've gone through. And in it, it says, no one can come. No one can come to Christ unless they're drawn by the Spirit. So no one can come. That's a word of ability. If you are without Christ, you have no ability to come to him. Unless you are drawn. What does that word drawn mean? It's the invincible power of the Spirit. Where when he goes to save that sinner, that sinner will come. By the power of God. They will. That is an amazing, amazing work where God softens that heart. God makes that heart see their sin. In light of a holy God under that guilt and condemnation. And they see Jesus. And they want nothing more than come to him as the Spirit's working. Because who do they see him to be? Their righteousness. A righteousness that is not their own that they desperately need. They don't have, you don't have righteousness in your nature in any way. So he had to come to live that righteous life actively and passively so that you could be given his righteousness, a righteousness that's not your own, so that you can stand before God blameless with a pure and white record. That's why Jesus came. He is the righteous one. And you need him. You need his righteousness because you have nothing. And even the things that you think you do in your nature that, are, that you think are good, God says that they are filthy rags to him. Romans 8 says you have no ability to obey the law. You cannot. It's in a word of ability. You cannot obey the law of God, but you have to. You have to. You have to be perfect. You have to be 100% obedient. So how does that happen? That happens because the righteousness of Christ stood in your place as your substitute to do what you could never do so that his work would be accounted to you as your own. Because you can't claim any for yourself. You have to obey the law of God perfectly. But you can't. Love. Where does love come from? It comes from the heart. Doesn't it? Right? Isn't the symbol for love a heart? Go read John 3, 19 and 20. In our nature, we love Darkness. Anything that is not done of faith or by faith is sin, Paul says in Romans 14. So again, here's the question. Does faith come before, before being born again? Biblically, no. So everything that you do before being born again, biblically, is sin. Because it's not done by faith. Do you see that? Do you see these connections that we have to have? Bringing all of the scriptures to bear upon this very issue so that we understand who we are and be driven from that to understand who Christ truly is? 
Why does Paul say that it's we who worship in the spirit, we who have no confidence in the flesh? We put no confidence in the flesh. What do you think that means? I'll, answer, I'll ask the question again. Do you have a free will in your salvation? That's what that means. Do you put confidence in the flesh in any way? Paul says the people of God don't. And he gives a whole list of what he could have put confidence into in Philippians 3. But he says all of that was worthless. It meant nothing. It had no value before God. The righteousness of Christ is what he needs, is what you and I desperately need. So you cannot put confidence in the flesh. And the more and more you do that, the more and more you say, but no, I got to be a good person. I got to do this and this, whatever it is. You're going against the very word of God, against the very word incarnate, Christ. Many people ask the question, how do you get into heaven? Just a very simple question. Many people say, I'll be a good person. Nine times out of ten, I've heard that. So here's the question, how good do you need to be? How good do you need to be? Oh, pretty good. Okay, how are you doing on that? Not as good as I should be. What does that tell you? What does the Bible say? Matthew 5, 20. If your righteousness does not exceed, is not better than the Pharisees and the scribes, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So let me ask this question for those who are moralists, for those who think they are good by nature in some capacity. Are you better than Nicodemus? Do you know the Old Testament like the back of your hand? Do you pray multiple times a day? Do you follow the law? I hope you say, I'm not as good as him. Then what does Matthew 5.20 say to you? And where does your righteousness need to come from? It comes from Christ. Romans 9.16, so then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. That's a very clear statement. We should search the scriptures for the rest of what God says on this whole, whole question. And we can go on and on and on, and I pray that you do, so that you come to a clear understanding of your true nature apart from Christ. If you're truly in Christ, so that you understand it more, so you glory in Christ more. So you're humbled more and more. But again, if you put any ounce that says, uh, it's but, but, but. You need to be humbled before God. So the question then as we come, have come to reflect more, how is this actually knowing righteousness in practical terms? Bring it down to more practicality. Well, the very base of all of that is the basis for everything, spiritually speaking. Knowing total depravity, knowing righteousness, knowing both of those biblically is the basis for everything regarding grace. What is grace? Again, can't have any human effort in any way. What is regeneration? Being born again, having that new heart, what does that mean biblically? Faith, what is that? Is that something that you do so you work with God, so God does everything as much as he does, but then you have to work with him with this faith in a synergistic, cooperative, cooperative way, and that's what faith is? Or is it a gift of God? Not because of what you do, so that you don't boast. It's the very production of God within your heart. If you have had faith in Christ and you continue to have it, who's doing that? The Spirit is. The Spirit is. Repentance. 
turning away from your sin. You can do that in your strength in some capacity? No. That's the production of the Spirit. The Spirit does that. The Spirit causes you from the very inward parts of who you are to turn from your sin, to recognize it for what it is and have an utter hatred for it, to turn away from it. Apart from Christ, you have no ability. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do a little bit. No, you can do nothing. That's literally meaning nothing that is appeasing to God. Righteousness, this is the basis for everything, for righteousness. You need to be declared right by God himself. By God himself. So is Jesus going to present his record and then you're going to give a little one-liner too to add in and say, I've done this too? Or is it all of righteousness, all of his record for you? Justice, what does that mean? Justice of God poured out on a sinner. What is fair for us? What do we, what do we deserve? We deserve hell, eternal damnation, eternal condemnation. Because that's who we are. We're sinners, we're rebels. And if you can't see that, then you can't see Christ. This is not trying to beat you down to tell you that you're such a bad person. It's to lift you up. So you see the glory of your Savior, your Lord, to see who he truly is. It's beautiful. Knowing these things is the basis for forgiveness from God. Forgiveness. Forgiveness of what? Of everything that you've done that's lawlessness. Everything. Everything. Go and write all that you've done, that sin, on a piece of paper with a Sharpie. Go write it down, make a list, and then take a pencil and try to erase it. That's a lot of quote-unquote Christians. They're trying to erase what they've done on their own. You can't do it. You can't do it. It's only by the grace of God that we are given forgiveness. Forgiveness. And that's the basis to then forgive others. To truly forgive others, we ought to have a true understanding of our condition because then we'll understand not only in discernment and understanding the situation, but also in understanding why they're doing the things that they're doing. If they're apart from Christ, then this should be a clear theological lesson that they're dead in sin and trespasses, that this is what they're doing and why they're doing it. That then helps you to forgive Because you understand fundamentally where they're coming from. They're under the power and enslavement of sin. And that's their Lord. And they're giving into that by nature. And so you can forgive them. You ought to forgive them. Because you have been given forgiveness. You were forgiven by a holy and righteous God. And if you have been forgiven, you remember where you came from who you were, so that when it's applied to situations in life, whatever it may be, you can forgive others. So I said before, that doesn't mean that you forget. It doesn't mean that you just give in and kind of go along with everything. No. True faith has a backbone, but at the same time, it understands forgiveness and gives it because we understand the depravity of man. You understand who you used to be again. You had nothing. It also helps with patience with one another. Whether it's behavioral or doctrinal, try to have patience with one another. And when we understand our nature that is turned against God, that cannot understand the things of God, 1 Corinthians 2, that have no ability to understand the things of God, then we can have a little bit of patience with people, right? We should, especially within the body of Christ. True Christians, we should have patience with one another. That doesn't mean that we let sin go unrepentant. No, 
We love in that we help. We help each other see sin. But oftentimes, all the time, we need to look inward first. We need to examine ourselves first, and that should bring us to have patience. And then understanding the world, not just looking at who we are and understanding us, where we came from, our new nature in Christ, all of what that means in righteousness terms, but then as we look out at the world. So as I look out at the world and see what's going on in our world right now today, as it's falling apart, as depravity is so utterly clear, wickedness is all over the place, if I understand this doctrine, these two facets of the Christian truth, the Christian faith, then am I going to understand that a little bit better? Yeah, hopefully a lot better. And I'm not going to be so wavered. I'm not going to be so uncertain, so anxious, because I understand the nature of this world. It's a fallen world. You know, what does that mean biblically? That doesn't mean that it's all going to go to hell in a handbasket. I just kind of watch it crumble. No, then with that, is an understanding of God's sovereign grace. That he brought me to life out of the life I used to live. And he can do that to me. He can do that to anyone. And when I know that he does that with sinners like myself or King Manasseh who offered his children up as a sacrifice and burned them, or as Paul was killing Christians, if I know that God can save sinners like those, then I know that this world can change. Not because we get another politician in some seat. Not because we do this socially. No, because the power of God goes out and changes hearts. And it goes through the gospel and bringing the law to bear upon hearts, both of them understanding them evangelistically and all together in all of life, drives me to have an optimistic understanding of the future and say, this is what God can do. And he actually has promised to do this. This is so practical. Total depravity is so utterly practical to all of life. We need to see it. And you need to see that if you're in Christ, that you Live in that forgiveness every single day. God's mercies, God's power within you, and his favor on you in Christ is new every single morning. And you need that because every single day you go into battle. You go into battle against the enemy. But who has had victory over the enemy? Christ and Christ alone. So that then his body... His bride, his people, follow in that great path. And so as enemies are crushed under the feet of Christ, now and actively throughout human history, the Bible says they're also crushed under your feet, the body of Christ. So you walk in that new life. You mount up with that armor every single day, and you take on that life, knowing that you have that purpose of God driving you, and God is sovereign in your life, and every single single thing that happens in your life is ordained by God for his glory and your good purpose. And as we connect this to the perseverance of the saints, in one regard, can your salvation be ever taken from you? No. You may be riddled with all kinds of physical ailments, all kinds of sicknesses, You may have so much go wrong in your life, you think, but what's the one thing that can never be taken from you? The salvation that you have in Christ. So you say as you live and walk through this life, what can man do to me? What can happen? I live for the sovereign purpose of God, and I know where that comes from, the sovereign grace of God. Because I was that bad. And in understanding that, I know that's good. 
and great and beautiful to understand that because I'm brought low to where I'm supposed to be and I'm brought high to where I'm supposed to be and that is looking to Christ and following him. So what righteousness do you claim for yourself? Honestly, if I would ask you the very simple question, how do you get into heaven, would you continue to rail and say, be a good person? I do this, I do this. I got confirmed, I'm good. I got baptized when I was little, I'm good. I did this. Forsake that. Forsake any of that righteousness that you can claim for yourself and take a hold of the only righteousness that you can have before God, and that is the, Christ, the righteousness of Christ and Christ alone. See his glory, see his greatness and goodness in what he's done. Let's pray. Great and mighty God, we praise you because you are gracious. Because you did not leave us to ourselves. If you left us to ourselves, then all of us would be separated from you for eternity. But you chose to be gracious. And that means that you chose before the foundation of the world to come into covenant with your son. And that upon that agreement, he would come. And he would save your people. And he did so. At the appointed time, he came to be born of a virgin. And to live that sinless, perfect life, that obedient life according to your law. And die the death that we all deserved as punishment as the justice of yourself came upon him. And that he was risen from the grave, defeating death. So that we can have reconciliation amidst defeat of death. And that we can then be ascended on high as he was and have a position at your right hand. That would never ever change. That's all that Christ did in his finished work. And then you, gloriously, in your plan, you bring the Spirit of God, yourself, your Holy Spirit, to bring life as we live our physical lives. As we're the walking dead, you bring life. You cause life to begin by your grace alone, and you cause it to continue by your grace alone. So that now we are alive and we can obey you and want to with a new heart. And that's the trajectory of our life is to glorify you. This is grace. That is grace. Any other definition that mixes in us is not grace. Let us see that. We need to. Because we will not see Christ, your son, if we don't see us. So Lord... Open up our eyes, open up our heart, and bring our will forth to see you and live for you based upon these beautiful bedrock truths that you have revealed to us with great, great clarity. We pray this all for the glory of Christ.